Today is Mother's Day. So I want to say Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers. I've, uh, I've heard it said that sometimes men and women who never stand in the pulpit preach the greatest sermons. They preach those sermons through living the word out in their daily lives. I think it's really true with mothers, and I know it was true with mine. And it's, it's very true with Mary, the mother of Jesus. See, after Joseph's death, she traveled extensively with Christ throughout his ministry. Let, let me read about one incident recorded in the Gospel of John that tells us about Mary's relationship with Jesus. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, <laughs> what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to him, Fill the jars with water and they filled them to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. And they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine he, and didn't know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests had become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Mary was first respectful of Jesus, and at the same time, she didn't argue with him. She said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And I'm, I'm not, he's, he's, it's like she's saying, I'm not going to argue with you, son. You know, there's a special relationship because of the mother she's been to him. Jesus shows her his respect for her and her wishes because it seems like he really doesn't want to get involved here. He says, my time has not yet come, but he does what his mother asked him to do. She's aware of his abilities. You know, mothers know what you're capable of. My mother would always tell me, Tommy, you can do that. You're good at that. Even when I wasn't. My mama believed in me. See, Mary pushes Jesus to a higher service. Mary pushes Jesus to begin what God is calling him to do. And Jesus, he kind of rebels. He says, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? But then he complies to the wishes of his mother. In Mary, we see faithfulness until death. She was with him till the end at the cross, which was, which was really ultimately the beginning. And, and Jesus, from the agonizing torture of the cross, is still concerned about the welfare of his mother. Which means, from the cross, he's telling John, behold your mother. And what he's really saying to John at that time is, take care of mama. Even in his death, He's planning for the future of his mother. His love for her was a direct reflection of the love she had shown him. And this is a story of not only a great mother, but of how we as children should treat our mothers. You know, some of us had great mothers. Some of us had not so great mothers. But in Mary, we see what mom should be. Let's think about that this Mother's Day. Be grateful if you had a mother like Mary. And if you didn't, if you didn't have a mother like Mary, even if you don't have biological children of your own, you can be a mother figure to someone who needs it. A, a grandchild, a niece, a nephew, a neighbor, or any child you may have contact with. Happy Mother's Day. Now before I get started with the sermon, would y'all pray with me? Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. You are our strength and redeemer. 
This week we're going, continue, we're going to continue, let me say that again. This week we're going to continue our sermon series, The Gospel According to. And if you're reading along, you would have read about the encounter that Jesus has with the woman caught in adultery. Let me read the passage for you. It comes from the eighth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. It's the first through the eleventh verses. The words are going to be on the screen for you. You can read along or you can read along in your own Bible. While Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and sat down and began to, he, and he, and, and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him, so they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down, wrote with his finger in the ground. When they kept questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, <clears throat> Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to cast a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote in the ground. When they had heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. If anyone can tell you about grace, it's the woman Jesus encounters in this verse in John 8. It's an interesting, and let me tell you an interesting detail about this story. In most Bibles, you're going to find it in italics or with a footnote explaining that this, is, this particular passage may or may not have been written by John. It, it's found in a lot of the ancient manuscripts inserted here or elsewhere in John's Gospel, but for, it's missing from, from the earliest manuscripts. From the oldest manuscripts, this story doesn't exist, which means that at some point, a scribe inserted the story into John's gospel while he was making copies. I, I like to think that, that even though there was no evidence of this, that it was probably one of the scribes who helped drag the anonymous woman from her bedroom. We may never know who penned this portion of scripture, but I think the Holy Spirit set aside a special place in the Bible for it because in many ways, her story is our story. In, in this story, these teachers of the law had promoted themselves to keepers of the law. And the Pharisees appointed themselves prosecutors, and they turned to the temple courtyard into a temple courtroom. And together, they presented their case to Jesus, who, were they, were, who they were hoping would play the role of the judge. Early in the morning, as Jesus was teaching people, it, it was like his early morning Bible study. He was interrupted by the Pharisees who wanted to trap him. They brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. I mean, she, she was caught red-handed. There, there was no denying her guilt. You, you could ask the question how, how, how this woman had been caught in the act so early in the morning. You, you could also ask where the man was. It seems just a little too convenient to have happened by chance. I think this was probably a setup. It was part of a, a premeditated trap to get Jesus. While the Pharisees were bringing to Jesus an impossible choice. If he had mercy on the women, then the crowd would say he didn't uphold the law. And if he, he was unjust, if he upheld the law, and let the woman be stoned. He, if, if he let that happen, he would not be merciful. He would have been violating Roman law too, 
because under Roman law, the Jews weren't allowed to put anyone to death. It's the same problem that's existed since the fall of mankind. How does a loving God respond to the problem of human sin? He responds in mercy and grace. He couldn't allow us to be condemned, but in his justice, he couldn't simply look the other way either. God did what Jesus does here. Like C.S. Lewis says, the Son of God became man to enable men to become the sons of God. The word used here for bent down is the Greek word kupto, and it means to stoop down. And instead of arguing the law with them or trying to appease the accusers, he simply responds by doing what he always does. He stoops down. He stoops down to our level. Let's examine the story just a, a little more closely. Let's start with their accusers. Nothing is more humiliating than being caught in the act of doing wrong. Whether it's a child with his hand in the cookie jar or an adult driving over the speed limit, we all know that sinking feeling of being caught. In John 8, this woman is caught in the most humiliating of circumstances, in the very act of adultery. The priest slammed open the door, they, they threw back the curtains, they pulled off the covers. She scarcely had time to cover herself before they marched her through the streets. And, it's a, and if that wasn't bad enough, they parade her in shame to the middle of Christ's early morning Bible class. While Jesus is exp explaining spiritual things to to people with God-hungry hearts, the Pharisees announced, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, caught in the very act, the moment, in the arms of passion. She's pulled from bed and pushed into the sunlight in front of Jesus and his students. Maybe you can relate. See, your accuser might not wear a long robe or have an unkempt beard like the Sadducees and Pharisees, but you have an accuser nonetheless. The Bible calls Satan the accuser of our brothers and sisters, the one who accuses them before God day and night. Day after day, hour after hour, relentless, tireless, Satan makes a career out of accusing. He points his gnarled finger in your direction and, and accuses you. The person caught in the act of immor immorality or stupidity or dishonesty or selfishness, greed, lust, whatever it is, the charges just keep piling up. And the worst part about this is he's not wrong. Neither are the scribes and the Pharisees. She was guilty. The woman was guilty. So are we. You know, I'm reminded of a scene that took place in San Diego at the Superior Court. There were two men that were on trial for armed robbery, and there was an eyewitness that, that had taken the stand, and the prosecutor started asking her questions. He says, so, so you say you were at the scene when the robbery took place? She said, yes. And, and you saw the vehicle leave at a high rate of speed? Said, yes, yes, I did. And did you observe the occupants? She said, yes, yes, two men. And then the prosecutor turned away from her and turned toward the people being accused of the crime. And he asked loudly, are these two men present in the courtroom today? And thinking that the question was directed at them, the two accused of the crime raised their hands like you do in school, present, and it sealed their fate. Now, that might seem stupid but we might as well do the same thing. We're guilty. We know it. Satan knows it. God knows it. We might as well raise our hand and admit it. The scantily clad woman in the midst of the crowd was in the same boat. She was guilty, and her accusers made sure everyone knew it. Fortunately, they didn't have the last word because Jesus stepped down from the judge's bench and he stoops down 
to become her advocate. Her advocate. You know, the Bible reveals motives behind this drama when it says they were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. John 8, 6 says this, it was true that the Old Testament commands the Jews to stone an adulterer, but Jesus refused to play their game. In fact, he ignored them. The, the Bible says Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. What on earth was he writing? Wouldn't we like to know? You know, I've heard a lot of theories about what he was writing in the dust, and I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute. The, the, the self-appointed prosecutors didn't like being snubbed, so they kept demanding a verdict. And finally, the Bible says Jesus stood up and he said, all right, but let the one of you who has never sinned throw the first stone. Suddenly, the accusers fell silent and the scornful, self-righteous attitudes softened and their grips on the stones loosened and the silence was broken by the dull thud of dozens of stones fall into the ground. See, bullies are all alike. Regardless of what century you're in, if you stand up to them, they'll typically back down. That's what Jesus did for this woman. He stood up until his shoulders were straight and his head was high. He stood up for her. He does the same thing for you and for me. The Bible announces the one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God this very moment, sticking up for us. Let that sink in for a moment. In the presence of God, in defiance of Satan, Jesus Christ rises to your defense. Christ offers unending intercession on your behalf, whether you deserve it or not. Jesus knows you're guilty. You stand before him just as naked as she did. He sees your dishonesty, adultery, angry outbursts, hypocrisy, pornography. He sees it all, but he sticks up for you anyway. Like this woman, we all stand accused before God, and like her, we're guilty. But before the sentence could be handed down, Jesus stood up and stepped in. And that brings us to the last part of her story, her acquittal. One by one, the Pharisees slipped away until Jesus was left alone in the middle of the crowd with this woman. That's when we, we, we witnessed this sweet exchange. Jesus straightened up and said, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. Ironically, Jesus said, let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. That narrowed the potential executioners to one. As God in the flesh, Jesus was the only one qualified to pass judgment but he refused to do it. I don't think that makes Jesus soft on sin, but I do think it makes him big on grace. Earlier this week, I read the story of a youngster who was shooting rocks with his slingshot. He never could hit his target. And as he returned to grandma's backyard, he spied her pet duck. And on impulse, he took aim at the duck and let the stone fly, and the stone hit the duck, and the duck died. The boy panicked, and he hid the bird in the woodpile, only to look up to see his sister Sally watching him. So after lunch that day, Grandma told Sally to wash the dishes, and Sally responded, you know, Johnny told me he wanted to help in the kitchen today. Didn't you, Johnny? And then she whispered to him, remember the duck? 
So Johnny did the dishes. I mean, what choices he had. For, for, for several weeks, he was standing at the sink. Sometimes it was his duty, sometimes it was Sally's, because when it was Sally's time, she would always say, remember the duck? Finally, Johnny got sick of doing Sally's work. He finally decided that any punishment would be better than washing dishes all the time. So he confessed to killing the duck to his grandmother. I know Johnny, the grandmother said, giving him a hug. I was standing at the window and saw the whole thing. I love you. I've already forgiven you. I was just wondering how long you were going to let Sally make a slave out of you. He'd been pardoned but thought he was guilty. Why? Because he listened to the words of his accuser. Don't make the same mistake. Satan likes to whisper his accusations in our ears. You're not good enough. You'll never turn your life around. You failed again. Remember the duck, he whispers. Remember your faults and your flaws. Uh, unlike the conviction of the Holy Spirit, Satan's condemnation brings no repentance or resolve, just regret. He's deputized a horde of silver-tongued demons to help him. He enlists people to peddle his poison. Friends will dredge up your past. Preachers will proclaim all guilt and no grace. Don't listen to the voices of condemnation and accusation. Instead, listen to your advocate the one who declares on your behalf. Paul writes in Romans, so now those who are in Jesus Christ are not judged guilty. John Wesley was the founder of our faith. He was a, a popular evangelist in, the, in early, early times in America and often rode from one church to the other to preach. On one journey, he was stopped by a robber. And the robber said, halt, your money or your life. And Wesley says he got down from his horse, he emptied his pockets to reveal only a, a handful of coins. He invited the robber to search his saddlebags, which only carried his books. In disgust, the thief turned around and got ready to leave. And, and Wesley said, stop. I have something more to give you. And the robber was puzzled. He turned back and Wesley leaned toward him and said, my friend, one day, you may live to regret the sort of life in which you're engaged. If you do, I beg you to remember this. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Wesley said the robber hurried away silently, and Wesley got back on his horse and, and rode on his way, praying in his heart that the words he said to him might be fixed in the robber's conscience. Years later, at the close of a Sunday service, a, a stranger stepped forward and begged to speak with John Wesley. Wesley recognized him. It was the robber who had stolen from him. But now, he was a well-to-do tradesman, and better still, he was a child of God. He grabbed Wesley's hand and he kissed it and he said, to you, dear sir, I owe it all. And Wesley replied softly, no, no, my friend, not to me, but to the precious blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us all from sin. Now, I told you, I wanted to get back to what Jesus was writing in the dirt. Getting back to the words Jesus scribbled with his finger. Like I said, I've, I've heard lots of theories. You probably have too. He was writing the sins of her accusers, or he was writing the names of others that had been with her, or, or maybe he was writing a pertinent scripture. Let me share one of the ideas that I'm particularly fond of. In his book entitled Grace, Max Lucado writes this. When a few moment, within a few moments, the courtyard was empty. It was just Jesus and the woman. Her critics, they all left. 
It was just her and Jesus. So imagine the scene. But let's, let's linger a little while there. Look at the rocks on the ground, abandoned and unused. And look at the scribbling in the dust. It's the only sermon Jesus ever wrote. Even though we don't know the words, I'm wondering if it read like this. Grace happened here. And it still does. Only God knows what happened to the woman caught in adultery. But I am certain that her life was changed. How, how could it not be? How, how can ours not be? Her encounter with Jesus was an encounter with outrageous love and amazing grace. It was a life-changing experience. Each one of us can have a similar encounter if we'll trust God and accept the amazing grace he has to offer us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your amazing grace that no matter what we've done or who we are, that you're there to forgive us. You're there to be our advocate. You're there so that we might have eternal life. Help us, Lord, to always accept the grace that you offer. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.